Hello, everyone, and welcome to Real AI Now, a podcast about real applications of AI in business brought to you by Two Impulse. So my name is Mark Giambetti, and I'm the product manager at Two Impulse, and I'm your host of today's session of Real AI Now. This episode is going to be all about careers in data science. Before I introduce our guest, I would like to ask you to subscribe to our podcast. Um, you find our podcast on the usual platforms like YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and also Google Podcasts, and you will find the links in the description below. If you like this episode, please also um, like it. Um, now I'm going to introduce our guest. So um, Mark Rowan, welcome, Mark. Hi there. Thanks, Mark. Hi. So Mark has a broad career in data science and AI and recently founded a Cognitive Data Science to bring all his know-how in this area together, deep technical expertise uh, and strong network, particularly in Switzerland and the Swiss data science community. That's also where Mark and I met at the time. Um, Mark's industry experience covers aerospace, telco, insurance, AI, so really broad um, spectrum, and also speak and match tech. Mark told me he, he trained in artificial intelligence uh, before it was cool and has a computer science degree and also worked and obtained his PhD as a scientific researcher on computational neuroscience, particularly working on modeling the Alzheimer's disease. So Mark has built data science teams in the past, has a broad career in data science, um, is working as a coach, a teacher and a mentor and currently spends his time between Switzerland and Mexico. And I think he just got to Switzerland uh, last night. So thanks again, Mark, for accepting being on the podcast. Yeah, very welcome. It's glad to be here. Thanks. Yeah. So Mark, to get started, what inspired you to pursue a career in data science and AI? So the data science part kind of happened by accident. Um, I was here in Switzerland 10 years ago now for my postdoc in neuroscience mm -hmm. and I decided to change the career but wasn't sure exactly how to define what I was doing. I'd always known that I worked with data and that I was doing stuff with computers but I didn't really know what to call it or what to search for in the in the job boards. Mm -hmm. uh, it actually turned out I got a job which the title was data analyst and data miner to begin with in a telecoms company. Mm -hmm. And later, it became very clear, ah, right, what we're doing here is is what people know as data science. So let's say it was kind of always in that direction. Uh, before even my PhD, I was working in a defense company on information processing. So mm -hmm. taking large amounts of information from different sources and doing smart stuff with it. So mm -hmm. we didn't call it data science. We just called it research. But... Yeah, the, the whole data science thing kind of grew as more of a label for what I do. Mm -hmm. that, that's interesting. So which skills do you think are crucial for this profession of a data scientist? Data scientist sorry. Yeah, this, uh, of course, has changed a little over time. I mean, if we go back more than 10 years to uh, mm -hmm. the famous LinkedIn data scientists, the, the ones that would do everything, uh, more or less turn the company around. Uh, at least so it was claimed. Uh, yeah, things have specialized now. So, of mm -hmm. course, it's well known that we have uh, formalizations in machine learning engineering or in data engineering or indeed data science. There's still a lot of arguments about exactly what skills fall under each of these different boxes. But I think one of the key skills that comes out of this specialization is the need to be able to collaborate. And by collaboration, I don't just mean the soft skills, of course, but I mean, you are, as a data scientist, very likely these days to be working in companies or in, in research groups that require writing code with people who are a lot more maybe engineering focused than you might be. So the ability to collaborate writing code in a collaborative system, to use version control mm -hmm. tools, et cetera, this has now become a must-have, I would say. Yeah. So um, what you're saying is, so um, there is more opportunity um, to go to go broader, right? But there's also the need to go broader to understand technology, to understand processing frameworks. Can you elaborate a bit more for somebody who's getting into this profession? Would you rather recommend specializing in a certain technology or domain, 
or going broader? What what is your advice there? Yeah, when we talk about specialization, if we're talking about still the relatively broad stuff like NLP or mm -hmm. uh, deep neural networks as applications for things, then yeah, you might find yourself drawn towards some of these, perhaps by nature of the jobs that you get or projects that you work on, or or not. I've worked in pretty much all of the things that we think of as data science in my in my time. In terms mm -hmm. of specialization. The trouble is that the more specialized you get, if we think about, uh, let's say, you want to learn TensorFlow and Keras specifically as a framework, then great, that's probably going to stick around for a while. But it's it's going to unlock some jobs and some opportunities. But <clears throat> it's also, uh, there's a risk of, for example, uh, a few years back, Hadoop was the big next thing. And mm -hmm. of course, it's still in use in places, but I remember once thinking I needed to learn Hadoop to get a, a better job in big data. And mm -hmm. these days, it's more of a niche thing. It's not where data science went as a, a general skill that you need to have on your CV. So okay. the risk of specialization is that you maybe over specialize in technologies. I would say specialize in areas, areas of uh, yeah. application. Okay, so so like domains, you would say, so yeah. like specialize in, in telco, in insurance, in, in, in finance in general. Or indeed in this, yeah. I mean, my research, my, my research, my career has taken me through different domains, um, two, three, four years per domain on average. So it's it's not even that I've become specifically specialized in any of those domains. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's more about, uh, I think, if... If you're really super interested in natural language processing, then focus on that. Look for jobs, look for projects, and put that as your your thing. Right? It's maybe not necessary to go right down to specializing in in transformer architectures unless you want to mm -hmm. be on the bleeding edge of that. Okay. So let's look at, at data science careers. So a bit like the path from deciding to get into the field through being at, at university or educating yourself in the field, but then also getting into the job and maybe looking at the future of this domain. So as somebody who wants to get in data science, it's a hot topic. It's interesting. Everybody talks about it. But what are common misconceptions about data science and AI, which may lead to disappointment when you study this? So what, what to expect from studying topics which are necessary to get into this profession? I think probably from the perspective of somebody who's starting in the field, one of the most surprising and maybe disappointing things is that most, most jobs don't care so much about you getting the highest accuracy after many hours of training a machine learning mm -hmm. model. It's Here is all about low-hanging fruit, solving actual problems, even if the simplest way to solve it is by doing a group by query and showing the results in a, in a table. You know, this yeah. is still data science, right? It's not all about implementing interesting models. And that can be disappointing. My first job also involved doing SQL queries and selecting customers. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe not the most technically exciting, but what I could see was the impact of my work on on actual customers. I saw those customers in the street holding the prizes that I had selected from the database for them to win. Uh, that mm -hmm. felt somehow impactful as well, even though it was not making huge changes in the company. So, so Mark, that's interesting. So these misconceptions may then get the better idea also, right, for somebody who wants to get into the field. Now, let's mm -hmm. say you, you are into the field and for instance, you're specializing in, you mentioned natural language processing as, as one subdomain, right? So that's Super interesting, super interesting field. We have seen uh, with GPT model, and in particular Chat GPT, a huge boost in uh, in interest also in this technology. So I think it's something worth studying. But now the question is, as an NLP student doing basic research in in that area, isn't it just completely disbalanced with this? AI companies who have huge data servers with compute, which actually makes the difference these days. What would you advise somebody in, in, in that area? Is it is it still worth doing that? And can you compete kind of with industry research? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I suppose it's one of the first things to mention, of course, is that it's the cutting edge of the research where this kind of computing is most needed. It's for training these models. 
So, and again, unless you're working in one of those big tech companies or you're trying to push ahead with fundamental research, then you can mm-hmm. probably get by with pre-trained weights and a good enough GPU to be able to access that and apply it to your problems. So depends on the kind of research you're talking about here. But yeah, in some ways it was always the case. Think back in the days of Gary Kasparov versus IBM Deep Blue. You know, mm-hmm. here that huge computing power was available to IBM. And in the defense industry as well, it's uh, like I was working in aerospace and defense. Uh, again, that kind of computing power is is available outside of research institutions. It's always been mm-hmm. the case. So partnerships are needed. Um, we need to continue making sure that there's strong links between academia and the industry. Uh, mm-hmm. And of course, I think probably my bigger concern uh, than the, the computing power alone is, I mean, computing power is a function of money that can be spent, right? It's the yes, same so. when it comes to attracting researchers. And there's mm-hmm. the potential for a downward spiral here, right? If you're a cutting edge researcher, a uh, professor, uh, a Jeffrey Hinton kind of person, you can go to a university and try to do your research there, or you could take a big money job in a tech company with 10 times the computing power. And mm-hmm. this is where the direction has changed in the last years. You know, universities mm-hmm. are now finding it harder not just about the computing power, but to have... To attract the talent. Exactly, right? And then without the talent, there's less money to put into the computing power. And There's the risk for me. It's not just about the uh, the power available for students to train models. It's it's a bit more fundamental than that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let's look into a bit into, into business, but maybe outside of big tech. So there is a lot of opportunities also for, for smaller companies, not necessarily tech companies, to apply AI to their um, processes. Mm. What would you say, what's the best way to bridge that gap between research and um, practical applications of, of AI in, in, in companies, in non-tech companies? Mm. So most practical applications in most companies are many years behind the research. Uh, you think mm-hmm. about now we can implement, what you want to call it, generation one chatbots or uh, straightforward machine learning models from the 1970s, 80s, 90s in order to be able to solve actual problems. So mm-hmm. bridging the gap there, that's that's nothing new. It's it's about knowing the appropriate techniques to use and the more importantly, knowing what is the problem to be solved. I think mm-hmm. for modern stuff, yes, where the excitement is. Uh, of course, we all hear about chat GPT right now, but think back just a few years when deep learning, deep neural networks were first big in the in the space. And now this has become quite standard. And it's come with the development of uh, and release of libraries like Keras and and other packages that make it easy for companies to be able to use this stuff. So I would say there's after the research wave, there is the wave of tool sets and automations and uh, the the data robot. Yeah, exactly. And at this point, then it's all about just getting the use cases sorted and the data sorted and the of course, the internal processes that are needed for it. Okay. So if I am, uh, let's say, non-tech company and I decide, okay, I want to apply these methodologies, um, maybe I'm thinking of a data science team or a data engineering team, or what is the best setup you would recommend anybody to use to get into data science? And also what may be common pitfalls, right, that companies already fell into and are currently falling into, uh, which are avoidable? So, of course, the answer is always, it depends. Uh, but <laughs> of, course. <laughs> of course it does. But, okay, so let's see. Uh, let's say if you are a company with a lot of data, uh, maybe in a retail business, mm-hmm. uh, but really just starting out, well, the first thing you've got to do is start to organize that data. You might need to think about building uh, customer journey data marts, mm-hmm. things like this. Before you even start thinking about trying to do predictive modeling for what the customer will buy next. It doesn't sound glamorous. It kind of sounds a little boring, but it's essential because otherwise you've got no basis from which to, to build on top of. So so get your data things. right is the first step. Absolutely. Absolutely. Get your data right. And that requires something between data management and business 
this requires really understanding the, for example, the customer journey and being mm -hmm. able to build data. We think of it like feature engineering. You could say like uh, building layers on top of your data, uh, the raw data, that allow for business decisions to be made from that data. Right. So okay. the pitfalls like that. Yeah. Sorry, Mark. Go ahead. No, no. Go. Go ahead. So. Um... Okay. Yeah, uh, so that would be the, the first pitfall is just rushing into doing uh, more, let's call it advanced stuff with data that's not yet uh, not yet ready, ripe for working with. Uh, okay. And in general, that applies also to the modeling, right? So I don't think it's so often the case, but again, the temptation is there to rush ahead with uh, with automating of stuff or doing cool things that are maybe perfectly technically feasible, but the organization isn't ready yet for adopting this kind of change. And that's the other pitfall that I see time and time again. Okay. So one aspect is change management, getting the organization ready to make use of data. Then you said no data science without data. So get mm -hmm. your data, do your homework and in, in, in getting your data ready. Yeah. Um, is it fair to say don't over rush into buying tools? Uh, yeah, I would say figure out the problem before you start buying tools for it. Absolutely. Uh, there's a lot of good tools out there, a lot of free ones. And mm -hmm. most data scientists coming in will have their favorite set from their studies, from their projects, from their previous jobs. So mm -hmm. it's best not to go too specialist with the tools that you go with if you're just starting mm -hmm. out. Because In the beginning, you say, oh. Yeah, exactly. If if you're setting up your data science department and you go straight into a specific vendor, the risk there is trying to find data scientists who can work with that vendor's tool sets. Isn't the risk on the other end that if you uh, give too much flexibility that you will end up with a zoo of scripts and nothing works together? What 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 do you recommend in, in avoiding, like, say, explosion of, of different tech? Yeah, that absolutely requires thought from the beginning, but it's mm -hmm. rather than going straight into a specific vendor's set of solutions, take that step back and think a little bit about, okay, we're going to we're gonna go forward with a specific set of languages, maybe Python and R, or we're going to mm -hmm. focus on just one of those because we find uh, a few good candidates who have Python skills, so we're going to go with that. Um, you know, it's it's also a bit of a cyclical thing. First of all, you need to start getting the definition of the work that you need to get done. And that's going to define the resumes that you then receive. And that's mm -hmm. going to start to define things a little bit more clearly in terms of, well, what are the, the technical skill sets and tools that are normally used here? Okay, well, that, that's an interesting reflection. Um, one thing which came to my mind, you also said before, um, free tools, so free as in open source software, right? Mm -hmm. I yep. was wondering, um, what is your reflection on, on, on the open source ecosystem? Well, in computer science, science, it has been around for quite some time, but now also in AI, it's, uh, it's emerging. Can you say a couple of words about what do you believe and where do you believe open source movement in, in AI is going uh, in the next couple of years? Yeah, I, I think it's super important. Uh, the benefit, of course, with open source software is that, of course, anybody can evaluate it and mm -hmm. validate it, right? So yes, it's true that there are vendor solutions which are more complete and better spec, and you may want to look at commercial solutions for things, but a lot of the open source stuff out there, uh, the whole of scikit-learn in Python, uh, even the AutoML stuff that's in there, uh, mm -hmm. if you don't mind getting your hands a little bit dirty with, uh, with coding rather than point and click stuff, then mm -hmm. you can do much of what you need to do with open source mm -hmm. software. I, I, I was also thinking of uh, so open source software, but as well also like open models, right? Pre-trained ah, models. Yes. You mentioned in the beginning that um, well, maybe I don't need all these data centers full of uh, servers to mm -hmm. train my model, but maybe I can uh, do training just on what is relevant for my particular business. Can you say something about this open? I don't know, open source or open models kind of movement, mm -hmm. like in hugging face, for instance. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is this I would say is essential for all but the the highest of high tech companies mm -hmm. that are really trying to build their own models, right? So yeah, of course we we don't want to rebuild 
language models or image models from scratch unless there's a really good reason to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. So taking what's there, and as of course we know with a lot of these deep neural networks, it's possible to take the pre-trained weights and then to just finalize the, the, the final layer here to train it for your specific task. Uh, yeah. In general, that's fine. I mean, look at the uh, word to vec as a, an older mm -hmm. example. You know, here the algorithm is there and there is a lot of um, benefit in training a word vector representation on your specific domain data. But that's OK, mm -hmm. because it takes maybe a few minutes to do that. Right. We're not talking here about training a, a whole transformer architecture. But yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. We, we need to make use of those. When it comes to open source software, uh, one of the things, of course, that the community always requests is that the companies with the resources to do so contribute back into the projects that they use. Uh, yep. you know, I don't don't see it happening so often with the small companies, uh, but most of the time, I think the the development resources are not there for patching Python packages. And but, keeping keeping up with that, yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah, exactly. That, that's that's super interesting. So. Um, I want to speak a bit about, about the future of also um, data science and, and careers in data science and where the journey is going. So maybe if you can say a couple of words, what are the, let's say, short term things you, 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 you think will happen, like maybe like five years and then maybe the next 15 years, where do you see the journey going? Yeah, so I think we're going to see an explosion in natural language processing applications and technology. Uh, mm -hmm. evidenced by, of course, the, the current uh, wave of interest in chat GPT. But mm -hmm. uh, this is not new, right? NLP has been the upcoming child of AI part of, uh, of uh, interest for some years now. Uh, let's mm -hmm. say when it comes to image, computer vision, this isn't going away, but it certainly had its day of hype already. And now we're kind of at that a uh, more stable state of uh, of working strongly with computer vision models that are relatively well uh, known and, mm -hmm. and well used. So yeah, I think we're now hitting that with NLP and we're going to see a lot of use cases opening up that were previously not looked at. And mm -hmm. for five years, it's hard to say. I, I think probably the NLP wave will last us most of those five years until the dust settles and then yeah. we're on to the next whatever that is and i'm not going to predict that one do you think in the next five years the turing test will be passed by one of these text-based applications actually there were claims already some years ago that it was already passed um there's a former professor of mine aaron sloman at the university of birmingham um he was on a panel which famously concluded uh, in some way that this text chatbot called Eugene, uh, mimicking, a, I think it was a 12-year-old Russian boy, so that therefore the English was a little bit suspect. Um, mm -hmm. And this was fanfared as the first test, uh, first passing of the Turing test. Now, mm -hmm. Professor Sloman actually then wrote a, a long article on his website about how that's a bit of a fallacy. Uh, and in fact, the... Uh, I don't want to wrongly paraphrase him. So, um, yeah, basically he disagreed with the notion that this is even how the Turing test is supposed to be applied. Um, I would refer interested readers to to find that article. It's Aaron Sloman on the Turing yeah. test. Uh, super interesting. There's also um, uh, Ray Kurzweil, right, uh, mm. who is doing predictions about the future. So I think his current prediction is uh, 29. So that would be like in six okay. years. Mm. Which is also uh, quite, quite on the horizon, right? Thinking about it that. is, isn't it? So, yeah. Mm. So maybe scratching in these five years already passed this <laughs> this time. So, exactly. I mean, the the point here is not about um, passing an arbitrary threshold of fooling people into thinking that you can talk like a, a person you would expect to talk on the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, I think here it's more about more. I'm more interested in how good is this technology at solving actual problems, right? Mm -hmm. So at the moment, there are arguments, I think strong ones, uh, chat, GPT, et cetera, are still token shuffling. They're still assembling tokens and then putting them out again. Mm -hmm. uh, we come to the arguments of Searle 
uh, with the Chinese room. Inside mm -hmm. that box is not an understanding. It's simply a mapping of tokens, right? So yeah. that's nothing to do with the Turing test. It's uh, the Turing test, of course, tells us that it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck. So it's probably a duck, uh, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. So, so there's another another thing, another interesting development, uh, which, to my impression, will have a huge impact on on data science. Is the full um, quantum computing, right, and development of the quantum computer? And um, can you maybe say a couple of words about where do you see um, applications? Also, what quantum computing will will change in the space of data science, and also what new possibilities emerge out of this out of this technology? Yeah, so this is uh, this is probably the really big thing. I mean, uh, that's when we talk about fundamental change to how computing is done and how society works. I expect bigger changes from quantum computing than from mm -hmm. from what we're seeing right now with NLP. Uh, we talk about things like cryptography. Uh, so once quantum computing is in a uh, stable enough or a system, what's the word I'm looking for? spent too long in Mexico and uh, too much Spanish okay. going on. Um, but yeah, once we're in a place where quantum computing So more is mature technology, more established. Yeah. Mature, established. Yeah, exactly. Uh, then, for example, all of our cryptography that we've used up until now is, is crackable. So now we need to have a fundamental switch towards new ways of uh, encrypting transmissions. And mm -hmm. when it comes to things like combinatorial optimization, so this is things like solving the traveling salesman problem, which is a well-known yeah. computer science representation of many actual real world problems, um, or indeed finding the best optimal set of weights for your neural network. These problems suddenly become treatable in totally different ways. So I, I'm not expert enough to be able to say, for example, that we'll be able to do uh, instantaneous weight training for deep neural networks. I, I don't, claim that that's what's going to happen, but certainly mm -hmm. fundamental shifts in how we compute are to be expected. This is one of those ones that's been 10 years away for the last 10 to 20, 30 years. Uh, <laughs> I, I also studied Always computing. around the corner. Yeah, exactly. Right. But there are moves, right? So we're seeing prototype quantum computers that can compute. We're seeing what I find really super interesting libraries that you can plug into, for example, Python, uh, mm -hmm. in the same way that you can switch between GPU and CPU in TensorFlow, they're making the possibility here to write your algorithm and switch to quantum backends if and when they're available. Mm -hmm. So right now, they're mostly simulated quantum computers, which are, of course, uh, yeah. very, very slow. But uh, when we talk about the availability of these kind of uh, hardware architectures, we're already developing the software tools that we need to upskill the uh, the set of people who are going to be programming these things. So, okay. yeah, it's a fundamental change coming. Okay. So, so for our listeners and viewers, so quantum computers are kind of, they're already somewhat, they have not enough qubits to do any practical kind of like applications, but the community is already developing these tools you need to develop actually meaningful um, software on top of those. So once technology is there, boom. Mm. Yeah, exactly that, yeah. Okay, so would you agree that then um, this is also one of the important skills for data scientists, um, youngsters getting into the field to, to learn or for those in the field to stay relevant? What are, let's say, the things a data scientist nowadays should um, look into, be worried about, be excited about? Hmm. That's a very, it's an interesting point. If you really want to future proof your career, but on a bit of a gamble, then take modules and courses in quantum computing. I think that's a, it's a good call. Um, I, it's too early to predict what will be the software toolings. And at the moment, we are still lacking a lot of things like practical algorithms to solve mm -hmm. current problems. But uh, that coming back to the start of our discussion, if we talk about specialization, this would be one that's, uh, I would say, beyond five years, but not far out compared to uh, working with AGI, et cetera. This would be uh, an interesting tool set to have in your skills. Uh, 
yeah, if you can understand the fundamentals of quantum computing and also start working with the tool sets that are being developed, uh, you could probably hit the ground running in a few years' time with some practical applications. Yeah. So if you would um, if you would have to give your younger self uh, some piece of advice with respect to a career in data science and AI, what mm. what would it actually be? Uh, stop worrying. <laughs> stop worrying. You don't have all the answers and you're never going to have all the answers. And in fact, at the younger self time, I was yeah, trying to find what do I do with the skill sets that I've developed? What's the job title that I should work on? What should I specialize in? Do I need to learn that skill or this one? In the end, I've had a lot of fun not knowing the answers to those questions and just following the next step that came. You know, and that's... Okay. It's not for everybody, right? I've enjoyed and I like being uh, diverse, variety. So I've followed different industries, different paths. Um, I wouldn't say I've ever had much of a career plan for myself, uh, mm -hmm. more of like just a willingness to try something new. Uh, so, so that would be openness my and Openness and curiosity are kind of like what led you Absolutely. to your, your career in data science. Absolutely. Well, Mark... Um, I want to thank you very, very much for, for your insights on your personal career, right? But also mm -hmm. data science careers in general. I think this was a very uh, fun conversation. It's uh, interesting to see your, your reflections about the field and also the future. So thanks again for, for being part on, uh, on the show today. Thank you yourself, Mark. Uh, really, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Also to our listeners and viewers, thank you for, for joining this episode. If you like this, please um, leave us a like on the episode and uh, subscribe to the channel Real AI Now for more interesting episodes. You will find us on Google Podcasts, Spotify, um, Apple, as well as um, YouTube. And I would say thank you again, Mark, for taking the time today. And um, yeah, enjoy the time in Switzerland. <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Take care. And you.